So good afternoon, everybody. My name is Dorit Rosen, and I'm a research scientist uh, at the Dutch Organization of Applied Scientific Research uh, in the Netherlands, do you know? And today I will be presenting to you the work done in the Super PV project regarding the feasibility of cost effect effective packaging of flexible thin film modules by using spatial atomic layer deposited aluminum oxide barrier foils. And this work was realized with a lot of people, but I will mention specifically uh, my colleagues Hank Stijvers, who did a lot of the practical work shown here, and Fieke van den Brulle, who is the ALD expert, and also Manuel Schule, um, and he's uh, uh, working at, uh, at Friesland. So the outline of my talk today is that I will first give an introduction, uh, including the motivation and the approach chosen for the work. Then I will tell a little about the partners and their contributions in the projects. I will introduce the ALD and spatial ALD technology and explain to you why it can be used as a barrier for flexible thin film modules, um, also called PV or solar modules in this presentation. I mixed them a bit up, I saw. Um, followed by the results of the lab test that we did on testing barrier functionalities. Um, uh, functionalities of the ALD layers, and some slide of the integration of the barrier foils in the FLISON PV modules, and of course outdoor monitoring results of modules with these innovative barrier foils compared to the reference foils. And lastly, I will share some conclusions with you. Uh, this work has been performed on flexible thin film uh, PV modules. They are uh, lightweight, have a low energy input for manufacturing, and are easy to integrate uh, with other construction elements, which makes them appealing for uh, building, transport, and portable applications. And in the pictures, we see examples of the flexible FISO modules in different applications. Uh, this thin film material used here is, is called CIGS, copper indium gallium selenide. These modules, um, they need for the package a flexible front sheet, um, of which the cost can be as high as one third of the module cost, as can be seen as the, in the last bar of, uh, of this grid, uh, graph. In this project, we want to develop technology for cost-effective application of closed and conformal nanometric aluminum oxide coatings on large areas by means of roll to roll atmospheric spatial atomic layer deposition, abbreviated as SALD. Um, I will also call this in the presentation aluminum oxide coating because the layer that we deposit is, is this aluminum oxide. So both words I will use. Next to this, we want to investigate on the lab the barrier functionality or the barrier coating functionality uh, applied directly on the solar cell material and the coating applied on a PET foil, which is then laminated onto these CIGS thin film modules from Frison. Uh, then after successful lab tests, uh, we are going to integrate this spatial ALD barrier foils on Frison modules. Uh, and monitor on the demo sites the long-term performance of these modules with innovative barrier foil and a reference barrier foil. <coughs> and that will be done on uh, sorry, three different demo sites uh, in, in Europe. Um, what we do is we, we monitor, that's what I already said, the long-term performance of it. So two partners are uh, mainly involved in this work, in this part of the work. Uh, that I present today. First is Flisson. They are a solar module manufacturer. Uh, as I told, it's CIGS based thin film um, of a flexible module. One of their products is the EFLEX uh, module. They are very flexible, have a high power to weight ratio, they have low installation costs, and they can be uh, used for light structures, roofs, and, and off grid applications. And the role of Flisson in this project is to upgrade the products with these innovations and supply reference and innovation modules to the demo site locations for this outdoor performance monitoring. Um, then the other partner, that's us, that's TNO, um, Dutch Organization for Applied Scientific Research, uh, where we work with over 3,500 people on uh, nine different domains, of which one of them is energy. 
And here we try to achieve a faster way towards sustainable energy supply, which is not only solar, but also wind and, and uh, hydrogen and other technologies. But of course, we focus on, uh, on solar. Um, the role uh, in the project of TNO is that we supply these lab-tested innovative barrier foils based on upscalable roll-to-roll -roll spatial ALD deposition techniques that we integrate these high-quality barrier foils in devices and evaluate the outdoor performance in time. Um, the Flisom thin film PV modules, they are built on a uh, flexible substrate, a plastic film, and they contain of a deposition of a back contact, an absorber layer and a, and a front contact, and a buffer layer. Um, and in, with intermediate steps where with laser some scribes are made. Um, and it makes in the end a very flexible light solar foil on the bottom right. This foil needs to then be, needs to be packaged in order to survive the, uh, the outside world. And after this encapsulation process, as we call it, where on top and on the bottom protective foils are laminated, this uh, foil becomes a module. Here again, uh, we see the solar foil with the specific layer buildup, but for the sake of, of clarity, we treat the, the foil and the bottom layers as a black box, indicated here with a blue box, um, and only look at the top side protection. Normally, a front sheet, this, this front side protection, is attached to the solar foil by using an adhesive. And the front sheet has two main functions. It's uh, a moisture, acts as a moisture barrier, keeping the moisture uh, outside of the module, and a mechanical protecting layer, pert and ensuring protection against uh, hail, wind, and other uh, weather aspects, but also it prevents soiling of the, of the module. Uh, we are using uh, an alternative moisture barrier based on the spatial ALD. So here we have the blue box again, the black box again. And we are testing two options. One is um, where the ALD barrier layer is deposited directly on the solar foil here on the left. And then we add a, uh, a non-barrier uh, front foil. And where one where we deposit the spatial ALD barrier layer on a, a, a front foil and then laminate it on the solar foil with an adhesive. Um, check what I want to say about this. Um, yeah, in this project, as I already said, we first um, performed lab tests to, to check which approach gives the best results. And we started out with, uh, in the top of this table here, with a well-defined uh, test where the spatial ALD layer was deposited on only a TCO layer, which was on top of a glass plate. This TCO layer is a transparent conductive oxide, and it's the top layer of this, uh, this solar foil. When then we tested the spatial AOD layer on the solar foil, so again on this TCO layer, but now the full stack was, was below. Um, and after that, we deposited the spatial ALD layer on a pad foil and laminated that on the solar foil. Uh, outdoor tested are the, the spatial ALD layer on PET, on this pad foil. Uh, also, outdoor tested is, is another innovative barrier based on PECVD, which is plasma enhanced chemical vapor deposition, in this case of silicon nitride, also deposited on PET. Um, I will not explain it, but, but come back to it in the results part. And of course, we uh, test the reference and compare to the reference outdoor. Now let's explain why we want to use ALD and, and what it is. So um, many different barrier solutions exist. However, if you want to use them for thin film PV, they are um, usually or often off spec. If it comes from some packaging solution, it's usually not good enough. If it comes from organic light emitting diodes, OLEDs, it's um, most of the times too good a barrier, so too expensive. Uh, they are also often too complex because they are uh, consist of multi layers and they need planarization layers or they are too expensive for large area production. 
the approach that we used in P Super PV is um, for the barrier foil to use a standard polymers, PET based, uh, single layer barriers, so no multi layers, and keep the barrier thin, which is a benefit for the transparency, uh, the throughput, and, and the cost. And for upscaling um, reasons or large area and high throughput, Deposition, we want to use roll to roll spatial ALD, uh, atomic layer deposition, ALD, uh, an atmospheric pressure deposition process, and no complex foil pretreatments. This can be realized with spatial ALD, but first let me explain to you conventional ALD. It's a very controlled method to deposit layer because it is deposited layer by layer. It's based on a chemical reaction that uh, occurs only on the surface. In this case, the uh, deposition of aluminum oxide is explained. And for this, we need TMA or trimethyl aluminum and water. First step is to expose a, uh, so this precursor, the TMA in, in red here, to the substrate. The whole area of the substrate is covered with one layer of, of molecules. And after purging, the excess of recursor is removed. And then we see this substrate with, filled with one layer of uh, molecules. The second recursor is then added to the substrate and this reacts to the, to the uh, um, first recursor. The reaction stops when the, full, the whole layer is filled with uh, water and reacted with water. After removing the excess again, uh, then we have a monolayer of aluminum oxide of about one, uh, 0.1 nanometer thick. And to make a thicker film, we need to repeat the steps. And for instance, for a 100 nanometer film, it requires 1000 cycles. And as a cycle time lasts about five seconds, this deposition rate is only in nanometers per minute. This layer, this um, you could see that it was built up in a very controlled, controlled way, and it results in a very high quality film. And you can really control the thickness of such a layer on atomic scale because you decide how many cycles you do. It also shows an unparalleled uh, conformality. Um, it, it has the ability to follow complex and 3D uh, geometries because it just covers the whole surface. And you can also deposit a wide range of materials, uh, which are listed here. But as I said, we, are, we chose for the aluminum oxide uh, material in this, uh, in this project. Um, back to these aluminum oxide barriers. They uh, act as a very, very good barrier. And this is because they have a very low pinhole density. This is because, as I said, the whole surface is covered. Um, the conformality ensures effective encapsulation or covering of irregular, irregular surfaces. Uh, and the fact that there is no reaction in the gas phase makes that the particle generation rates are very low. The water vapor transmission rates of these closed layers are very low, even for, uh, for thin films, so uh, thin, thin layers. This we can also see in the graph um, on the y-axis, we see the WVTR, which is the water vapor transmission rate in gram per square meter per day. The lower, the better, the less water comes in. And we can see that for a thickness of only 20 to 40 nanometers of this aluminum oxide, it already shows lower WVTR uh, values than um, this PCVD silicon nitride. And because we can have these very thin films, uh, we can have increased um, bendability and transparency, which can be beneficial, especially for these flexible modules, potentially lower costs because of the uh, less material usage. But as I said already, the, uh, this conventional ALD has a challenge, which is that it's very slow and it uses a vacuum and purging time, so it can be seen as an expensive uh, deposition technique. This can all be overcome with spatial ALD. Um, the difference here is that spatial ALD is based on 
spatial separation of the half reactions instead of time, time separated. We saw in a conventional ALD that the precursors are added one after another in time. And in spatial ALD, the precursors are exposed to different parts of the substrate, which is uh, going underneath the, the gas inlets um, at the same time. So gases, these gases, precursors, gases are separated by a gas bearing, making ensuring that you only have one precursor at the time at the substrate. So the substrate moves, and this makes each part of the substrate to see both uh, precursors one after another. And in this way, by keep moving the substrate, we can um, build up again uh, layer thicknesses. This is, can be done under atmospheric press, pressure. Um, and because the substrate can be either a roll or a, a large sheet, it uh, is compatible with roll-to-roll -roll processing or large area sheet-to-sheet -sheet processing. Um, and it's also faster because we don't need to, to vacuumize uh, or purge each time. And the deposition rates is in nanometers per second. So now hours become minutes. Um, the method that uh, I explained in the previous slide is um, uh, can also be implemented. It was in a horizontal way, in a flat way, so to say, but it can also be implemented in a drum, as can be seen here on the top right. And the drum rotates counterclockwise and the foil rotates over it clockwise. And by setting the speed, the thickness of the layer, the deposited layer, can be determined. The other images show uh, other spatial ALD tools that we used in this project. On the left, a lab scale rotary tool, and on the right, uh, a sheet to sheet tool. And here again, the same tools, but then in real life pictures and not in schematics. Um, so the aim of this project is to show the feasibility of the spatial ALD barrier technology based on upscalable technology. And the barrier foils that were produced for the demo sites in, um, in, in this project were produced on the roll-to-roll -roll concept, and which is designed such that it can be upscaled um, to wider foils, a bigger drum where you can realize with what you can realize a faster deposition, et cetera, by industrial partners. So this is a upscalable technology. Now let's go to the results. Um, the technology used for this project, of course, first was checked on, on barrier properties by, mean of, by means of these WVTR measurements, water vapor transmission rates. And this graph shows uh, our own measured data of the WVTR measurements on different thicknesses. Of, uh, of this layer. And as you can see, we can reach between 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 5, with layers already uh, of 20 nanometers and, and thicker. We need uh, so we need at least these 20 nanometers. First, the lab test that was done, I already introduced it a bit, was done in a very controlled way. Uh, we used um, conductive tracks on a boron silicate, silicate glass on which we deposited small patches, here indicated in blue, of this transparent conductive oxide. This is a transparent uh, conductive layer, which is the top layer of a, of a solar cell. And with these tracks, um, we can measure the resistance of, of this patch in a uh, four-point connected connection way. These samples were um, covered with this aluminum oxide layer. In this case, it was chosen to be 50 nanometers thick. And these samples were then put in damp heat tests to, to check the um, stability of the TCO resistance. Uh, other samples, of course, didn't have this aluminum oxide coating, and we compared the two uh, configurations. The result of this test is shown in this graph. Um, the x-axis shows the hours in the damp heat treatment, so this 85 degrees at 85% relative humidity. 
and on the y-axis we see the resistance um, in, in ohms. As we can see, the, the, the graph goes up to almost 3000 hours. And as we can see, the red line shows an increase in the resistance, meaning a worsening of the conductive properties, which is not favorable for on, uh, on the solar cell, of course. And the blue line, which is the TCO, uh, in this case, it's aluminum doped zinc oxide, uh, AZO, uh, protected with the aluminum oxide. And we can see that this is, stays stable. This means that the aluminum oxide layer stabilizes the TCO in this treatment. Uh, the second test I want to mention is where we deposit the aluminum oxide layer again directly on the TCO, but now on the full solar cell. Um, we also tested non-protected solar foils here on the left, we call uh, bare and solar foils that were protected or laminated with a non-barrier front side foil uh, and foils with the ALD layer directly on the, on the solar foil and also protected with a foil without additional uh, barrier properties. Um, the last configuration we also tested in uh, dry heat conditions. The other ones were all again tested in damp heat, which accelerates the degradation. Um, but this last one we also test in dry heat to, to see the effect of uh, heat and damp heat, so the combination of moisture and heat. And the results of this test are shown here. The bare foil, uh, the black line, here on the, on the left shows a fast degradation in damp heat. Um, the y-axis here shows the normalized power conversion efficiency of the solar foil. And we can see that it drops to about 20% of the initial efficiency after, well, 350 hours or so in damp heat. And so this proves that we need to protect these solar foils against moisture. Um, the one, the solar foil that's uh, laminated with a non-barrier front sheet uh, shows a little bit better performance, but also shows uh, a drop or degradation. And here we reach the 20% after a thousand hours. Then we have the blue line, which is the solar foil with the ALD directly on top and then laminated with a non-barrier uh, film. Uh, and it shows an improved uh, performance compared to the other two, but still not, uh, not a stable behavior. Um, if we compare it to the red line, which is the same configuration uh, on the, on the, as given on the right, but only in dry heat, then this proves that the moisture is really leading uh, or the cause of the, the degradation, because that's the only difference in treatment between the red and the, and the blue line. Then we had the, the third lab test, which is um, this spatial ALD aluminum oxide barrier deposited on a PET foil, which was then laminated to the solar foil, which is given in the uh, top image. And we compared it here uh, with the same solar foil with a reference front sheet with barrier properties. The results of this test are shown here. Uh, Again, the damp heat exposure time on the x-axis and the normalized efficiency relative to reference is given here on the y-axis. Um, so normalized to the, to the reference means that the reference stays, uh, stays at 100%. And we can see in the red line, which is the aluminum uh, oxide um, treated solar foil, that the the performance is, uh, is almost the same. There is a little degradation, but it's, it's well, close to 100%. And as this gave, gives a stable result, this is what we use for uh, the modules for the demo site. This slide shows uh, another uh, result of this ALD layer on a PET foil, um, on another CIGS uh, material. And here we see four different samples and four different lines, which show uh, a stable result. So this was proof enough for us to use this technique. Um, 
Yeah, so for the project, as I said, we chose this spatial ALD on PET as option for the demo site. And um, we also have over the past 10 years developed uh, and experienced this, this PECVD silicon nitrate barrier foil. Uh, and we also decided to take this version in the, in the comparison because it was available a, a lot sooner than the aluminum oxide foils. And we compared the both to the, uh, to the reference, to the commercial solution. And both, uh, yeah, that's, that was the, really the, the nice part. Both were laminated. Um, we, well, we had to work on the integration, which is lamination on industrial laminator at Flisson production sites. So no lab tools and lab tests anymore, but the real size industrial equipment, which for barrier foils, maybe you can imagine, could be a challenge. So on these slides, I can give you an impression of uh, the work done of the laminations uh, at, at Flisson. Um, so we see on the left, the module assembly, well, it's built up uh, as described before, uh, then a module after lamination, and on the right, the racks filled with the uh, Innovation 1, the PCVD foils, and the reference mod modules ready for transport to the, to the demo sites. And on the bottom, we see some of uh, installed FISO modules on the Oslo demo site. And also for the Innovation 2 modules, where the spatial ALD on the PT foil was used as front sheet. Uh, they were laminated at Flisson, and they, they, these can be seen on these pictures. So in the end, uh, here we see the, all the module configurations with the numbers for a demo site uh, on the different demo sites in, in Vilnius, in Seville, and in Oslo. We have different numbers. Uh, for the different technologies. And one thing to mention is that um, we have used a, a support plate to hold two FLISOL modules, which are given here in the schematics with the, the gray blocks. Um, but the two modules are monitored separately. Uh, and the support plate is, is used because it has the same size as the crystal and silicon modules which is also part of the innovations tested in the super PV project on the demo site. So in this way, we can keep the frames the same and still test all these other uh, and different sized modules. Uh, the following slide shows an example of a demo site, in this case, uh, Vilnius, in a schematic way, um, where yeah, more than 100, I believe it's 105 solar modules are uh, placed and monitored in this project. The modules uh, on the bottom and on the left in the blue uh, shaped, sh dark blue shapes, show the modules and the positions of the reference here on the bottom right and the innovation modules of Lisson. And all modules are monitored constantly and on a daily basis. And we can check the performance of the modules compared to, to one another uh, and to the other configurations. For the results, so these slides, sli this slide shows the results obtained so far of the three different demo sites where the FLISO modules are, um, Vilnius, Seville and Oslo. And in orange, in the graph, we can see the output of Innovation 2, which is the spatial ALD atom, uh, aluminum oxide, compared to the, to the reference. And in blue, the output of innovation one compared to the output of the reference module. We can see um, in all the three different demo sites, well, that the innovation two seems to be more stable than innovation one, but it could also be, and this needs to be uh, checked uh, in the last months of the project, that innovation uh, one could suffer more from soiling or something leading to worse output than innovation two, so that the barrier is still intact, but uh, that it just shows more output because of things like that. But as I said, uh, that kind of analysis should still be done. We can also clearly see that uh, all innovations still perform, um, but that optimization of the innovations is possibly needed because 
um, yeah, they are not so stable as the references. But the reference modules, they are optimized in a lot of ways, uh, processing, but also uh, properties like reflection, um, anti-soiling, that kind of thing. And uh, they have a lot of experience already. They are, yeah, they are experienced already for many years. These innovations only have their first uh, chance in this project, so to say. So then I come to the conclusions. Um, yeah, I think we have shown that feasibility of the spatial ALD based and PECVD based barrier foils uh, has been proven and tested on fleece devices. Also, the outdoor stability has been tested for one to one and a half years for the different configurations on the different demo sites. Uh, shown that the outdoor results show that Innovation 2 performs a bit better than Innovation 1, but both act as a barrier film. And optimization on aspects like reflection soiling and mechanical stress optimization, which can be tuned and processing, but also mechanical outdoor protection will likely lead to even better results. Um, mind that these are only barrier foils and not the, the full package foils. Um, industrial upscaling of these foils does look promising, and I can tell you that the upscaling by the industry has, during the course of this project, already started, but um, it's, it's not part of this project, so it will not be discussed here. Um, but that's, I think, uh, a good, very good news. Um, this is the end of my talk. I thank you for your attention and would like to know if there are questions. questions if you have questions just raise your hands in the reaction so obviously obviously not for the moment that's good it can always be asked later or through you maybe when i leave the, the meeting <laughs> exactly yeah um, yeah if they come later Exactly. Then uh, just write an email to me and I will forward it to Dorit. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Dorit. Thank you. And thanks again for uh, letting me go first. It's yeah. very, very nice. Good luck with the, the meeting. And then uh, you can continue with the next speaker, I guess. Yes. Okay. Now we go. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye bye. And I would uh, call our colleagues uh, from Lordera and Tegnan uh, to give uh, their talk now. Okay, thank you very much. We will try to, uh, to share the screen. Yes. Le let us know if you can see the, the full screen mode. I can. Works. Perfect. So here we are. Uh, uh, Jesus and me, Julian uh, Crespo, we are part of uh, Tecnan and uh, Luredera. Uh, more in detail, more concretely, uh, Luredera is a research and uh, development uh, center who was born in 2002 and, uh, that, and uh, that has focused uh, its efforts in, uh, in the sector of nanotechnology. Thanks to the efforts, uh, Luredera comes with a, with a great expertise in, in the field of the production of uh, nanoparticles, even including uh, very specific and custom-made nanoparticles with uh, unique uh, properties. By its part, Tegnan was born in 2007 as a spin-off of, uh, of, of Luredura, with them to uh, transmit uh, this knowledge in the, in the nanotechnology sector to uh, the production of uh, final, final and uh, ready to use uh, products able to, to, uh, to be uh, incorporated in, uh, in the market. Both of us, uh, we are located in, in a smaller region of uh, Navarre, in, uh, in, uh, in the village of, uh, of Los Arcos. And today we are going to show you a little bit our, uh, our, expert, our expertise already mentioned before. And uh, uh, a small summary of the preliminary results that we have uh, obtained uh, within the, the Super PV project. As I said, 
uh, we 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 count with a with a great expertise in the in the production of uh, nanoparticles. To do so, for the production of the nanoparticles, we we use uh, our own technology, which is called uh, flame spray pyrolysis, we, which is a very simple uh, technology since. Uh, we, we start with a liquid precursor uh, mixture made uh, of organometallic precursors that pass through a, through a flame. And in this moment, the, the organics are burned and uh, we, we, we just remain with a metallic uh, content that uh, will produce the, the nuclei of uh, metallic uh, nanoparticles due to the oxidative uh, atmosphere. Such as this uh, nucleation and growth occurs in, uh, in such a very small period of time, we, we are able to, to produce very small nanoparticles between 7 and 25 nanometers with a very hom homogeneous, uh, in a very homogeneous level and with a, with a, with a narrow size distribution. Uh, well, uh, as, as I said, we, we start from, uh, from a liquid precursor mixture which uh, made, made by organometallic uh, precursors, it allow us to produce uh, organic nanoparticles, metallic uh, nanoparticles, sorry, from almost the whole uh, periodic table. We are able to produce both simple and, uh, and uh, also nanoparticles that contains more than one uh, metallic element. In this sense, uh, it is worth, worth uh, to mention that, uh, that with this technology, uh, we are able to produce uh, lar lar large amounts of nanoparticles in a, in a one-step uh, process, obtaining uh, big, big amounts of uh, nanoparticles that, uh, that present uh, high thermal stability, purity, and that are being produced in a competitive uh, way, so with, uh, without a very high price. Uh, during the years, uh, as I said, we, we have been uh, being much more uh, experts on, on, on that field, but uh, during the last years we have been uh, working in, in the incorporation in the incorporation of these nanoparticles into uh, liquid and stable uh, dispersions, and finally into uh, ready-to-use uh, products and different matrices able to, to be applied and uh, to obtain uh, nano coatings with uh, a multifunctional uh, properties. Now in the next slides, I will try to show you uh, some examples of, of, of these uh, effects. For example, the first one is uh, related with uh, porous materials. With, uh, with, uh, with our coatings, we are able to, to produce a hydrophobic uh, layer that protect uh, stones from uh, water or, or, or steam, maintaining the color of the stone and uh, the natural breathability, since uh, the coatings uh, allow the pass of vapor or water vapor from the inside to the outside of the, of the coating, uh, being able to, uh, to avoid the internal humidity, but uh, does not allow the pass of uh, droplets of water Till, till, till the stone. Uh, even like, even um, being uh, more, uh, trying to find uh, more uh, functionalities, these uh, matrices can incorporate also uh, active materials that, uh, that produce uh, or, 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 or give uh, photocatalytic uh, and or antibacterial uh, properties to, to the stone. Following with a glass substrate and transparency, uh, our coatings can be uh, have been adapted to be applied on the wheel screens of the cars, trying to reduce the the contact between, between water and, uh, and 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 the surface. In the, in in this way, uh, the the visibility of the of the driver is much better, and uh, the possible uh, accidents due to a heavy rain conditions are completely uh, dec drastically decreased. Following with uh, this substrate, also incorporating some active uh, material, we are able to control the, the amount of light that enter to, to, to the to buildings or, or, um, or cars and so on. 
Yes, uh, and uh, in this way, we are able to control the the, the temperature since uh, the, this infrared component of the light is the one we, which is responsible of uh, of the heating of the of the elements. In that way, we are able to uh, to improve the internal air quality of uh, buildings, for example. Following with uh, other materials, we are we are able to. Uh, to, uh, to, uh, to coat different substrates, such as metal or fabrics, uh, giving them uh, different properties uh, that can be used as, for example, uh, in, in metal, uh, these easy to clean properties can be used, for example, in, in industrial kitchens, or uh, giving them uh, properties such as anti pulino or anti-corrosive uh, properties that can be used in offshore farms or um, different elements that are in contact with, uh, for example, uh, sea conditions and uh, sea water, uh, in order to protect them from uh, from corrosions. Regarding fabrics, uh, as well as uh, with uh, stones, uh, the use of hydrophobic uh, coatings can can uh, can can allow us to improve uh, the useful life of uh, of, uh, of the fabrics since uh, we are protecting them from uh, from soiling and uh, from other uh, different uh, damages but also from antibacterial uh, properties uh, at the same time that we maintain the color of the of the fabrics and the and the touch from our side we are also very active in uh, in research and development uh, projects as can be seen in in this slide we are involved in, uh, in many different uh, projects currently in many different topics, such as the in, in the case of marketplace related with the material modeling of uh, for, for industrial innovation, the the, the case of SEOCAT, uh, which is related with the production and optimization of uh, nanocatalyst for the, the conversion of methane, the, the, the recovery of uh, raw materials, uh, val uh, or I mean, uh, uh, valuable uh, metals in the case of the iron for raw, or the use of uh, different uh, nanoparticles made by FSP in the nanobiomedicine uh, sector, uh, such as is the case for the IOT or the Safe and Medtech uh, projects, or the improvement or un mean minimizing uh, of uh, different uh, fuel cells, uh, batteries, or, or the odds in the case of, of nanostacks, or the promotion of, uh, of energy renewable, uh, renewable energies and, uh, and environmental uh, protection, such as is the case of uh, marwin with to, to fresh or miseruate. In, uh, in this uh, last group, uh, is also incorporated the, the super, PV, super PV project, which is the, the main focus of, uh, of, this, uh, of this talk, in which uh, we are trying to, to address, uh, uh, to solve uh, two problems of uh, models, which are uh, su such as uh, reflections and, uh, and soiling. Uh, in, the, in the first case, in the, for, for, uh, for reflections, uh, it, it, they can produce a, a they, they produce a decrease of uh, of the amount of light that uh, reaches the cell, just limiting the the energy that can be uh, obtained in the in the in the in the by the panels, but also limit the the location that uh, where where uh, those models can can be installed since they cannot be installed uh, close to uh, to airports, for example trying to avoid blinding of the of the pilots. So far, current uh, current solutions are, uh, are are based in the in the, the position of a, of a of a layer with a really well determined uh, thickness and uh, an intermediate uh, refractive index between uh, air and uh, and glass. Uh, in this sense, uh, light can be uh, absorbed or uh, transmitted, and uh, reflections are avoided. The, the main disadvantages of, uh, of, this, the, of the current solution is that when, uh, when the light is absorbed, 
there is no increment of uh, the, visible, the visible light that can be uh, converted by, by the model. And even more, these uh, this, uh, this layers uh, are being deposited by really uh, difficult and expensive uh, technologies such as uh, chemical vapor depositions that, uh, uh, that at the end make, uh, make uh, the, the final product uh, much more expensive. By our side, what, uh, what we proposed in the very beginning of the project was to, to use our easy to apply the uh, products or, or uh, coatings with aim to, to increment the amount of light that, uh, that can be converted for, uh, for, for the module. At the same time, that, uh, that uh, the, the reflexes are, are eliminated. Uh, later in this talk, uh, my, my colleague Jesus will, will explain you a little bit better the, the results obtained. But uh, as a preliminary results here, uh, we, we are in the, in, in, the, in the good way, in this sense, with a, uh, with a really cost-effective uh, technology. Regarding uh, soling, which is the, the main problem of, of the panels, uh, we are trying to, uh, to use our expertise with aim to, to reduce the soiling deposits uh, like dust uh, or, or and, and so on, but also different uh, soiling that can be uh, deposited on top of, of the modules due to the weather conditions, such as snow, for example, and uh, as I said, uh, dust that can be uh, uh, sand that, that can be uh, moved uh, for, 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 for the wind on top of, of, the, of the modules. So to prevent uh, soiling losses, actually, uh, uh, PV plants uh, carry out uh, costly cleaning and, and maintenance operations that increment the price of the final product. But also that, but also with the with these uh, operations, uh, the the useful life of of the modules is being uh, drastically reduced uh, due to the chemicals employed. And uh, as, uh, as a third disadvantage, which is a one a big one, is that uh, during these uh, operation uh, processes, modules are not working, and uh, then they are not uh, producing. Producing. This is the reason why we uh, we uh, proposed uh, the use of our coatings to modify uh, PV surface with aim to uh, to reduce the contact between uh, soiling particles and panel surface. To do so, we can, uh, we can um, follow two different routes. For, by, by one side, we can create, uh, we can modify the roughness of, uh, of the surface with aim to, uh, to obtain a hydrophobic effect that uh, produce it, that produce that soiling, which is uh, in, um, in uh, in the rain, for example, is not in contact with uh, with the surface, and then uh, soiling deposits are not uh, are not appearing. On the other side, we can use different functional groups with aim to obtain uh, the opposite uh, effect, the hydrophilic effect, in which uh, the the water and the surface uh, the, this uh, this contact is being uh, enhanced with aim to uh, to create a curtain of water that. Uh, that uh, drive dust till the till the bottom of the of the soil of, of the module. More, moreover, this uh, hydrophilic uh, effect can uh, can present uh, electrostatic forces that uh, eliminate uh, uh, dust from the surface, uh, avoiding avoiding uh, the, this uh, this contact. From now on, uh, Jesus will uh, will show you more in detail uh, results obtained uh, within the uh, Super PV project. Yes, hello, thank you, Julian. In a first step with the development of the solution of the project, it has been possible to obtain a reduction in the incident light and an increase in the in the, the light that reached the photovoltaic cells. So as we can see in the in the graphs, 
Uh, we have able to achieve a reduction in the reflection from 78 point to approximately uh, to more or less 56 that is uh, correspond to the relative reduction of 20 percent in the on the other hand uh, depending on the location pv panel can be treated with the hydrophilic or a hydrophobic solution to achieve the anti-soiling effect as we can see in the video, uh, the interaction of the of the water with the glass is very different in in one or the other side of the of the glass. Depends on the coating that is uh, applied of of the different uh, parts. So in the in the left part, corresponding to the hydrophobic effect, we can see uh, how the the water is. Uh, the glass repel all the all the water. The 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 drops of the water uh, run out of the the glass, and in the in the right side correspond to the hydrophilic surface. We can see how a thin layer is formed that is has the property that is uh, was uh, reduced uh, homogeneously, uh, uh, avoid the formation of of uh, drops of the water in the in the surface. Uh, furthermore, in the in the case of this uh, hydrophilic layer, uh, we can show the anti-soiling effect that uh, the coating uh, produced in the in the in the glass, because it's very easy to remove the the dust uh, power that is. Uh, drops into the into the glass. So uh, as we can see in the pictures, uh, the application of the coating of the different coatings is very easy. Only is needed a, a, spray, a spray gun and it's a very simple process. Furthermore, the, co the coating cure at room temperature. So it is possible to apply them in in factories to, uh, uh, when we fabric, when we produce the the panel, or, but also in the PV installation that are uh, working in the different parts of the world. So the uh, the project during the project we are monitoring the coatings in very different demo sites around the world. Uh, so uh, we analyze the performance of the coatings. Also in cold and wet weathers, like uh, Oslo or Norway, in uh, Vilnius in Lithuania, but also in hot and dry weathers, like Sevilla or, uh, or Tose or in Tunis. The result that we can achieve in this uh, first year, uh, year of monitoration during the project are very promising. So in the case of the cold and wet weather in Oslo, in the Sintef facilities, in the graph, uh, you can see the result uh, during uh, August 2021 to June 2022 in using the modules from Solitech that has been applied with the different hydrophobic and hydrophilic solution. As we can see during all the periods, in all of the months, the production of the uh, treated panel are uh, more effective than the uh, reference of the corresponding uh, panels. More in detail, we achieve a gain of more than 5% and 5 5 with the hydrophilic solution. And uh, furthermore, the hydrophobic show an improve of more than uh, 3%. So we we think that it is a, a, a very good step in the in the improve of the of the production of energy using a simple and easy to apply solution of nanocoatings. The case of uh, Apollo modules uh, also in the synthet facilities. Uh, in this case, we can see that in more or less all the months, the production is the same, but uh, all the case. The main reason or the principal point uh, about this is that the reference of the Apollo module have a, a commercial anti-reflective layer. 
So we have able to uh, uh, achieve the same conversion, the same FCNC using our nano coating that using the uh, commercial anti-reflecting layers. But we have the advantage to uh, this facility to apply, this facility to use in very different situations. When we use uh, hot and dry, when we analyze or we study hot and dry situation, we have seen uh, very similar situations. In the case of Sevilla, in the Ayesa facilities, when we study the uh, performance with the solitech modules that have uh, that uh, it no it doesn't have the anti-layer commercial anti-reflective commercial layer, we have seen an, uh, a gain of more than two percent two percent in the case of the hydrophilic uh, coating. And when you when we compare the results in the case of the apodon modules. We have a similar pattern because the between the anti-reflecting nano coating with the anti-reflecting commercial layer. And lastly, is we compare the result of uh, hot and dry weathers in in Toseur, in in Toseur, we can we can see that in the Solutech module a gain of more than four uh, percent in the case of hydro hydrophilic uh, nano coating. This is a, a core, this is a core or this with the with the fact that in this uh, weather is the quantity of dust of powder in the atmosphere is probably higher and it is probably the difference the, of performance in the hydrophilic and hydrophobic uh, nano coating because the first one is more efficiency between the uh, fight with the with the dust. Uh, all uh, a similar in the other uh, other places when we use the Apollo modules with our coatings or we compare with our coating or with the commercial layer, we saw a, a, a similar a similar performance between the panels. So now brief summary: when we use the Solitech modules in the it, we have achieved an increase up to 5% more or less versus the reference modules in the both types of weather, uh, cold and white or hot and dry. And we, we study the performance in Apollo modules, we have seen a similar uh, performance with our nano coatings that with the commercial anti-reflective layers. As uh, Julian said at the beginning of the presentation, dust is a very important problem in the in the production of energy up with uh, solar panels. It is the responsibility of the loss of the 10% of the of the efficiency, efficiency that is more or less quantified about uh, 15 euros per module and year. The, the main effect with our uh, nano coatings is that our technology, we can maintain clean the PV model for more years, increasing the benefits of the, of the installation. So thank you so much for your attention. As if you have any, any question, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, uh, Torsten. Yeah, thank yeah, you. Thank you. Very interesting. Uh, what? Uh, what about clarification? Sorry. Is, um, there's some uh, echo. Yeah. Yeah. There's some echo. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the the Solitech modules. Have they any the, the, the reference Solitech modules? Have they any uh, commercial coating from before, or are they not coated at all? The reference modules. Modules are not coated. Not coated. As, no, for Solitech, no. no. 
the case okay. of uh, of Apollon, they they incorporate uh, two anti-reflective layers, if I, if I'm correct, yes. in both sides of of the of the glass. And and uh, just to compare apples with apples, uh, so yeah. the Solitech reference models they are not coated at all, mm -hmm. neither front side nor back side. And the Apollo modules, they are, they have both the commercial coating and your coating on top. No, 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 no. no. This is oh. not the point. Reference modules uh, incorporates uh, commercial anti-reflective layers, but our coating, our uh, our treated modules uh, uh, were were treated uh, by us without any other commercial layer. Okay, so that means that the Solitech modules, reference modules, actually have commercial coatings from before? No, not, not, not Solitech. In Solitech, uh, we, 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 have, we applied in, in both cases, we applied uh, na naked uh, modules, yeah. naked glass modules. And uh, in, in the case of Solitech, are referenced with a, with a naked uh, glass. See. But in the case of Apollon, they, they are, uh, they, uh, they, they, uh, the reference yeah. incorporates a commercial anti-reflective layer because i think most modules now are actually coated most commercial modules are coated so that would be the more the the, the more reasonable uh, cooperation uh, comparison uh, another question goes to the um, um, soiling mm -hmm. uh, on the different demo sites, have you monitored if they have had uh, different cleaning operations, or how is that? It, it, it should be stated that the, the the cleaning operation should be the same uh, for reference and for treated models, and uh, we uh, we uh, we make a big uh, big efforts uh, saying that uh, uh, no no not uh, not 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 making cleaning uh, cleaning operations we we will be able, we we are able to obtain much better results for 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 ourselves in order to test our coatings against the uh, weather uh, weather conditions i see i see thank you very good okay thank, thank you. I don't see any other questions, I guess. Uh, Barbara? Um, yes, um, I hear you. Um, so then I would uh, like to thank um, both of you um, again for your talk. And um, I think um, we will skip maybe the uh, coffee break to catch up a bit and just go on with Alexander and then we are uh, perfectly uh, in our uh, agenda back. And uh, therefore, I would like to say goodbye to both of you. And uh, we come now to Alexander's talk on recycling of modules. OK, thank you very much, Barbara. Let me just go to my presentation. Yeah. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay, good afternoon. So I will present some selected results from recycling uh, related activity, which were, we were doing uh, for more than three years in frame of Super PV. Uh, so results will be based on collaborative work with Synthef. Uh, Transheim, since I'm employed at Sintef Oslo, and also we involved uh, NTNU at Technical University in Trondheim uh, to perform some actions related to Super PV project. So short outline, I will talk just uh, along the value chain. Uh, for recycling, delimination of silicon models, extraction of silver, extraction of indium for relevant solar cells, and extraction of silicon. Uh, 
Одинаковый summarize. So we have raised from the very beginning quite important question related to realization of circular economy for PV. Uh, and in this project, we are uh, focusing on glass glass uh, models, including by Fashul. Uh, glass glass models, since this is the main trend now to move to uh, cost effective, high efficiency uh, solar models, uh, by fascial models, and by the definition, they have glass glass configuration. Uh, if you will compare with monofascial uh, models, uh, we have some common part, at least uh, half of the uh, model in case of monofascial model consists of glass EVA silicon. Uh, for bifascial model, we have such configuration from both sides. And uh, yeah, therefore we are addressing um, recycling activities and possibility to make recycling uh, for both cases, uh, which includes this common part, glass EVA silicon. And in this activity, we are referring on um, a directive, VEE directive, which requires to recover 85% uh, of um, uh, valuable materials from any uh, electronic device, including PV models. And this is what we were trying to realize and demonstrate in the frame of our uh, super PV project. As I said, we can, for instance, in case of um, uh, monofascial models, manually remove some aluminum frame, uh, junction box, uh, tedlar if we have on backside, and we will come to a common for glass glass models uh, configuration or structure consisting of glass, uh, EVA, and silicon. And uh, first step, which uh, should be done, of course, to separate these three layers, glass, EVA, and silicon. Silicon-based uh, solar cells. And we are uh, doing this uh, separation using heat treatments as many groups for a long time already. And this activity is based on uh, weight loss during heating of um, EVA. And there is a well-known uh, result which shows uh, loss of weight upon uh, heat treatments, um, which shows that EVA can be evaporated actually at temperatures below 500. And therefore, of course, many groups have tried to use this result to evaporate simply EVA uh, there are dozens of publications on this subject, and this publication shows that indeed uh, it's possible to split all layers by such treatments. Here is a result of uh, such activity, one hour at 500 degrees C. Uh, it's publication just two years back, uh, several years back, uh, and we have glass uh, ribbons and uh, silicon uh, solar cells. As a result of uh, such process, the weak point here is that glass is not um, fully transparent. It has always uh, yellow color, and this is of course uh, a drawback of such approach because somehow we have to clean feather glass if we are using such heat treatments. We can call that this process uh, is related to pyrolysis of EVA, but disadvantage is that glass is not fully clean, transparent. We have repeated such exercises. We took different types of um, pieces from extracted from uh, silicon models. We also uh, have tried to uh, delaminate a mini model consisting of one full solar cell just typical examples and we reproduced of course all these results uh, and we can see that um, part which was covered by eva has uh, yellowish um, color 
part which was without EVA is not uh, how to say uh, it is fully transparent and we extracted uh, pieces of silicon wafers. To improve a bit such uh, process, we went to higher temperatures. It was just uh, how to say simple attempt to test higher temperatures and we found that uh, EVA is highly flammable. And instead of pyrolysis, we switched to uh, combustion process. And uh, from the uh, image from the right side, you can see that it's highly flammable. We optimized sizes of samples which can be treated in a safely, safety uh, way. And uh, as a result, we got absolutely transparent glasses without any traces of something, most probably carbon. And this is what we investigated in details uh, for different cases and so on. And all the time we were getting a pure glass ready for further processing and ribbons and uh, pieces of uh, solar cells. We tested a uh, mini model as well, and we just extracted pure glass. Uh, in this case, uh, one part of glass glass mini model was broken from the beginning. It, it was not broken during the process, and we extract absolutely pure glass and solar cells and uh, ribbons uh, using this uh, combustion based approach. And process takes only five uh, minutes, which is reasonable uh, for industrial application, in fact. Uh, such uh, investigations uh, based on pyrolysis, not on combustion, have been performed long time ago by several groups, especially in, in Germany, and they investigated, of course, what is the result of the pyrolysis or operation of EVA. And uh, they uh, already demonstrated a long time ago that there are several types of gases uh, during such process, which means that, um, yeah, uh, we have emission of gases, which of course could be analyzed in details and so on, but emission of gases can be, or formation of gases can be used uh, for delamination. And in fact, if we will take a look on so-called smart technology, which is widely used in uh, silicon industry uh, to exfoliate layers, for instance, of silicon uh, to make thin layers up to nanometers uh, thickness or one micron thickness or any thickness. Uh, microelectronic, uh, my, my people who are working in microelectronics, they implanted uh, gaseous atoms, argon or hydrogen mainly, then by annealing, they are creating bubbles, and um, if they are using so-called stiffer, um, just to uh, how to say strengthen a bit this exfoliated layer, uh, then it's possible to exfoliate, for instance, several microns of silicon in a safety way using uh, this uh, formation of gases bubbles from hydrogen, for instance, which will cut silicon as a so-called hydrogen uh, knife. In fact, we have similar similar uh, case when we are dealing with uh, a large scale, let's say, mini model. We have formation of gases beneath the glass, and by this uh, formation of gases, we exfoliate in fully uh, glass without breakage. Um, like in case of smart cut uh, technology. So we analyzed the remaining parts uh, after delamination and we concluded that um, in weight percentage, we have 91% weight percent for glass, 58 for silicon with metallization, 0.4% for ribbon, and the remaining part is EVA, which was born out in our combustion uh, basic pro uh, process. Uh, 
So it can be concluded that uh, VA directive can be realized since glass already extracted glass already above 85 percent uh, recovered material extracted material which can be reused again uh, for PV needs. We have tested also um, um, innovative um, structures which uh, have been reported in previous uh, uh, presentation. Hydrophilic layers, the same process, five minute uh, process, uh, demonstrated the same behavior, which means that uh, glass was not affected by additional hydrophobic layer on top, which means that glass can be extracted in case of hydrophilic layers. But in case of hydrophobic layers, we have seen a lot of traces, uh, pre presumably uh, uh, related to incorporation of carbon. But uh, as soon as we were keeping uh, uh, combustion process a bit longer, or heating process a bit longer, 10 minutes, then we have observed uh, dramatical cleaning of such uh, uh, contaminations. So which means that in principle, if we will continue, we can uh, fully, most probably can fully uh, clean uh, this uh, extracted glass from uh, traces of carbon. Special attention was paid for important parameter related to energy consumption, energy recovery and CO2 emission during our combustion process. We estimated on the basis of uh, uh, parameters of our uh, pyrolysis furnace or combustion furnace that we need to keep running uh, this process about 120 kJ per one kilogram of crushed panels. OK, this is uh, just a rough estimation of energy consumption. But from the literature, we also have found that energy recovery for uh, combustion of uh, EVA provides energy emission also of formation of energy in the range of uh, megajoule per kilogram, about 40 megajoule for different types of EVA, according to uh, literature. So which means that uh, energy recovery in case of uh, combustion or burning of EVA is comparable with energy produced by biodiesel or natural gas. And this means that we can simply burn pieces of models and use them as a source of energy and the output is remarkable, I would say, which means that probably it's possible to organize some kind of self-supporting process without any investment on energy. We only have to ignite this flaming and using, for instance, a in kind of conveyor furnace, we can uh, just uh, uh, provide uh, insertion of material in into this hot zone with 600 degrees here approximately and uh, yeah it will be self-supporting combustion process co2 emission we were trying to organize some measurements but unfortunately it was not that simple since process is quite short uh, and uh, yeah, our colleagues from Synthetic Energy were not able to organize properly these measurements. Therefore, we made uh, rough estimations uh, based on weight percent extra uh, burned or extracted from panel, which is around 7.4.7 uh, weight percent and assuming that uh, everything or most of these gases uh, will go for CO2 or will consist of CO2, we can roughly estimate. Of course, it's the maximum amount. Real um, amount of CO2 is lower, probably 50%, since as gas is also formed. But this is just to make some estimations regarding CO2 emission. 
uh, special attention was also paid uh, to for recycling of uh, the lumin of um, uh, models from uh, Apollon. Uh, since these models uh, don't include EVA. They can be easily recycled by several methods. We simply, for instance, at Sintov, we, uh, we broke some panels just accidentally and uh, accidentally, and uh, we could extract all components, glass without, of course, traces of something, uh, metallization, uh, cup of wires, for instance, uh, pieces of silicon and so on. Um, at Luxchem Tech, they were using uh, a flesh and lamp treatment, and yeah, they extracted a remarkable uh, amount of um, copper, uh, silicon, uh, pieces of uh, silicon based solar cells, and glass. So there are some uh, additional problems based on uh, configuration of um, nice models from Apollon. Uh, it was not properly actually uh, probably discussed in some cases, but we found that they have uh, lines based on uh, in kind of resin, uh, resin which they are printing uh, laminating on the back side of uh, their uh, glass glass models and such lines consist of uh, organics which in our case we removed by again um, heat treatments at 600 degrees C for 10 minutes we couldn't remove uh, some lines special lines for innovative models which included so-called uh, reflector. We could not remove this by such treatments, but uh, originally uh, deposit uh, or printed uh, resin-based uh, parts were removed, and then simply we put all uh, removed uh, parts of such uh, uh, resin-based lines uh, put here on silicon wafer and we got pure uh, glass which can be recycled of course if it will not include a white reflector which was artificially printed for some specific purposes so classical standard apollon uh, um, models uh, can be re fully recycled with additional heat treatment to remove uh, remaining organics based uh, layers. Uh, summary for this part would be formulated as follows that fast combustion based process can be used for delamination of silicon models. Industrial scale equipment should be used or developed to optimize such process because uh, we think that it could be a kind of conveyor for noise, uh, which in principle can be, uh, how to say, constructed from or modified from a firing furnace in PV industry, just conveyor with hot zones, with upper zone up to, let's say, 600 degrees C, and continuous um, uh, uh, supplying of uh, pieces of broken silicon, so it 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 can be done. Then uh, energy consumption uh, should be investigated in details, but it seems that uh, such process can be realized as a self-supporting process, since EVA is highly flammable. Of course, all these processes have to be analyzed from the point of view of uh, costs. And final decision for most effective, cost effective options can be drawn only after uh, such analysis. Very short um, um, description of extraction of silver. As soon as we are extracting silicon, um, so, uh, pieces of silicon solar cells, 
they have on front side uh, mainly uh, silver based metallization. In simple cases on the back side, they have aluminium. Aluminium can be etched by HCL and um, uh, silver can be uh, etched by special uh, solutions. Uh, so it was done by Luxchem Tech. They so did not describe in details which solutions they were used. But uh, in principle, they demonstrated that uh, they are getting after uh, such treatments uh, silver chloride uh, and can extract silver from uh, such uh, solution. So, of course, still the question is how effective such process will will be realized on industrial scale because treatment in any solution is not that simple. You need uh, a steering process, of course. Uh, and we will see a bit later that it's not always possible to do it in a homogeneous way and so on. But uh, it, the basic process is available and uh, have been and has been uh, realized. Few words about extraction of ITO layers in case of heterojunction solar cells, which have ITO layers. Uh, the same situation actually is valid for thin film based uh, solar cell CIGS, for instance, quite often they also have ITO layers on top. And then, of course, question how to remove or extract indium from ITO layer. We demonstrated that uh, simple uh, plasma treatment in a simple plasma reactor without load lock uh, in a mixture of uh, argon 97% and hydrogen can provide a reduction process of uh, ITO layer and uh, ITO layer deposited on textured silicon can be converted into layer consisting of indium uh, balls or nanoballs, micron size balls. At high magnification we can see how ITO can be converted in such metallic ball based layer and these uh, balls can be simply removed by mechanically for instance from the surface of silicon. So they will, uh, they are uh, including of course indium and tin since it's 95% for instance indium and 5% of tin but nevertheless metallization uh, uh, metallic parts can be extracted from ITO layer in case of relevant solar cell structures. And this is a dry process without any chemicals, uh, wet chemistry and so on. Simple uh, gas uh, plasma, uh, plasma treatment. Now I will uh, move to extraction of silicon, which is probably more very interesting for synthetic activity since we are working a, work, uh, working a lot with um, uh, silicon. So we have uh, basically uh, two different types of solar cells. If you will just make rough, how to say, splitting of types of solar cells, we have classical solar cells with silicon base, emitter, uh, anti reflection coating. And we have heterojunction solar cells, which in fact uh, quite different because they have very thin emitter in the range of uh, 10-20 nanometers from amorphous hydrogenated silicon. And then instead of silicon nitrate, they have ITO layers on both sides, symmetrical structure. Of course, um, uh, extraction of silicon is different because we have different materials and they have to be treated uh, differently. In case of heterojunction solar cells, as I have uh, mentioned already, we can extract ITO either by simple uh, etching process in HCL or we can remove uh, indium tin using plasma. And then we have very thin emitter on both sides and, be, uh, and on back sides the same layer. In case of bifacial heterojunction solar cells, it can be etched easily, of course, yeah, because amorphous silicon and 
Silicon can be treated differently, and there are several solutions which are selectively etching amorphous silicon and not all or almost not etching uh, uh, monocrystalline silicon. So this is quite easy case. In uh, more conventional uh, diffused emitter case, for instance, or classical solar cells with different variation, of course, IBC, um, uh, PERC, and so on and so on, we have more difficult situation because emitter and, for instance, in simple case, aluminium, BSF, and base have the same nature. It's monocrystalline silicon. And therefore, it's not that easy to etch selectively emitter and aluminium BSF, for instance, to extract a base consisting of uh, pure monocrystalline silicon with a moderately doped level of dopants. Uh, just to demonstrate the problem, we made two seams, for instance, for aluminium BSF based solar cell, and we found that. Uh, on the back side, aluminium penetrates into silicon up to 10 uh, microns, which means that 10 microns have to be etched to extract moderately based, uh, uh, moderately doped base. On front side, we have emitter, which is about half a micron, heavily doped, several uh, orders magnitude higher doping level than base, which is also a problem. So, but in general, we have to etch at least 10 micros from both sides, uh, which is not that easy because on large scale, as I mentioned, this etching uh, requires steering and homogeneous uh, etching rate for both sides. We tested a lot of different solutions. In laboratory scale, it, it, it looks like this. We also made uh, some uh, collaborative uh, developments with uh, Ferroglobe. At the time, it was Ferro Atlantica to age, uh, let's say, dozens of kilograms on industrial scale with steering during the process. And then we uh, repaired from etched silicon uh, mini ingots and we investigated. Uh, dopant level uh, in a mini uh, Chihralski grown ingot uh, on bottom and on top uh, parts of such ingot. And here are some uh, results. We can see that um, we uh, could not, inf we could remove a bit uh, phosphorus during such aging, but phosphorus still was present in quite remarkable uh, con concentrations uh, on um, in, in both cases. Uh, for instance, in case of uh, uh, synthetic uh, case, which means that uh, uh, it's not that easy to most probably age homogeneously uh, such uh, pieces in high quality especially. And for instance, uh, phosphorus, which is coming from emitter, cannot be fully removed. And sometimes as a result, after such etching process, we were getting uh, N-type ingots, uh, although we were treating uh, P-type based solar cells, which means that emitter was not fully and homogeneously etched and phosphorus still was present. What is also important that in all cases we were etching about 30 percent of silicon. So therefore in this approach uh, loss of silicon is remarkable and moreover it was not that easy to get high quality silicon um, from, uh, from the base of solar cells. So I will not go into details uh, of our activities, but uh, they were focusing on growth of uh, different ingots, Chakralski and um, multicrystalline silicon. Wafering was done at Fraungofer, and solar cell processing was done at Solitec. And uh, here I am presenting results uh, from um, 
project, European project Cabris, since in that project we were able to get to the final stage to solar cell processing. And what is important that uh, in case of uh, standard processes, uh, the overall efficiency was about 16% for aluminium BSF based solar cells. And um, um, maximum was 17%. And in case of etched uh, silicon uh, based feedstock, uh, we could get only about 11% uh, maximum. Uh, so, uh, and in average, uh, about 10%, which means that this process based on etching of uh, silicon demet demetalized uh, pieces is not optimized and requires a lot of optimizations still at this stage. Um, According to my at least knowledge, uh, it was never demonstrated that such approach can provide uh, fabrication of solar cells with efficiencies close to reference pro uh, structures. So therefore we, uh, in frame of uh, super PV, decided to test um, quite innovative process based on vacuum refining of the metallized silicon uh, uh, charts. This process consists of two steps, pre-refining step, which uh, should be realized at temperature 1600, and then vacuum refining step, which is, which requires 1100 degrees C at low, uh, at, uh, at vacuum conditions. Just the uh, latest results, we could demonstrate that okay, oxygen a bit, can be a bit uh, reduced, for instance. Important that nitrogen, since we did not remove uh, silicon nitride from solar cells, they were having a blue layer on top, but nitrogen can be evaporated. And also, calcium concentration can be reduced dramatically during such vacuum process. What is also important that uh, remaining uh, uh, concentrations of silver, which probably uh, was not etched properly during uh, the metallization process, can be also reduced dramatically. Also, tin can be reduced dramatically. So, uh, boron was staying on more or less the same level, but phosphorus concentration was reduced dramatically. So, and what is important that uh, silicon loss in this process uh, is in the range of three, five percent, which means that uh, such process uh, is quite interesting since it's based only on, on evaporation and vacuum uh, dopants and uh, impurities, not silicon. Summary to this part looks like as follows. A still industrial scale process to extract pure silicon from solar cells uh, is required. Uh, aging root can be still, of course, optimized and so on, but uh, of course, loss of silicon in the range of uh, 30 percent should be reduced somehow, if possible, since we have to etch only 10 microns. Uh, could be that uh, it can be done in a smarter way. It is junction solar cells uh, regarding um, extraction of silicon uh, looks quite promising since uh, losses of silicon are lower and can be selectively uh, amorphous hydrogenated silicon etched to extract uh, silicon monocrystalline uh, base. Uh, Vacuum-based evaporation can be considered as alternative to etching route since it, uh, it can provide only 3% loss of silicon. Again, cost estimations have to be done 
for all alternative approaches and final decision after industrial based uh, to say optimizations have to be uh, drawn to conclude which uh, approach should be used on industrial scale to extract uh, silicon uh, from broken or extracted from panels solar cells. Overall summary uh, looks as follows. Uh, extraction of glass from silicon PV panels is well established and can be used in a frame of circular economy uh, related processes. With glass, everything is clear, and most of the companies like PV Cycle and so on, they are just considering extraction of glass as a main uh, process for uh, PV related uh, circular economy. Extraction of silicon is challenging. It should be further analyzed. Uh, so this is clear. Several approaches uh, have been tested and uh, more even can be found in literature. So still, as, uh, extraction of silk is, is an open question. Extraction of indium from ITO layers is possible, but again, cost estimations should be done since layer is very thin. And uh, uh, it's necessary to estimate uh, how to say logistic uh, based problems because to collect huge amount of panels to extract uh, one kilogram of uh, indium, for instance, would be too expensive simply from the logistical point of view. Therefore, cost estimations here have to be done on uh, the surrealistic uh, level. Finally, I would like to thank two colleagues at Sintef, partners from Super PV project, and you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alexander. Excellent. Are there questions from the audience? From the no questions? I don't see any. Oh, no. Yes, there is one question. Yes. Do you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, very good talk, uh, Alexander. Thank you very much. Uh, my question is related to what you are stating on, on the um, uh, glass, the last slide. If you can show that slide again. Now how to show it. So, yeah, I don't remember the wording. <laughs> yeah. Because okay. you claim that uh, to to recirculate the glass from the mod modules are well is well established. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, what does that mean in terms of technology readiness level? How far have you come? How close is that to a possible commercial um, right. level? Yes, yeah. Uh, unfortunately, I don't know any how to say uh, results uh, based on uh, demonstration of uh, fabrication of tempered glass for PV from recycled uh, ex uh, glass recy uh, extracted from recycled panels. Re results are not known. Mainly people are using this glass for other applications like bottles, yeah. uh, normal glass and so on. Right now we are trying to realize it uh, with Fraungofer CSP uh, from Halle, uh, but this is not that easy. We are just discussing which company can take responsibility for such demonstration and so on. And even in Germany, Fraungofer Institute was not able to demonstrate. They, they are using the same approach on industrial scale. They are extracting tons of glass. Mm -hmm. And they cannot find partner who will include their okay. class into process. This is so, the main problem. Yeah. So it's kind of a circular economy problem, bottleneck right. problem. Yeah. Right. I see. Right. Yeah. It's more yeah. easy to convince other uh, producers of glass to test for building, uh, for, for um, concrete applications. Mm. Yeah because you uh, they're adding glass uh, in, in some concrete 
and so on. Also for bottles and so on, but for PV industry, it's, it's very specific. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, I have a question myself, Alexander. Um, yeah. Do you know um, about the PERC solar cell Fraunhofer is made from 100% recycled silicon? Do you know how they um, recycled the silicon? Yeah, I'm discussing with them. We are now, uh, how to say, designing new application for recycling of PV models. It was done by, uh, published by Professor Peter Dolt. Yeah. We, are, we are discussing, but okay, he's not disclosing. What I could okay. only get from him that they're using the same combustion based approach to delaminate PV panels and to extract silicon. Okay. Yeah. But and the rest is. <laughs> yeah, I hope that soon or later we will we will come to common how to say understanding and so on, but. At least they approved that um, um, uh, vacuum refining looks much better than etching. And they mentioned that they also found uh, that uh, during etching process, they have losses in the ratio of 30%. From this, not direct confirmation. I can conclude that they have etched etching process. Yeah. And they expressed very high interest to our um, uh, vacuum refining. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. okay. So, if there are no more questions, then I would thank um, Alexander again, and I would say we make a, a short break until five o'clock. And then go on with Claudia's uh, talk um, from Eric and uh, hope to see you soon back. We keep everything running so then we can start again. And uh, thanks a lot for the moment. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Good. I would say we can have the coffee now. Yeah. <laughs> You should train the doctor to ask questions every time. <laughs> Otherwise, Professor, can you hear me? Alexander? Yeah, Hello? Uh, yes. Can you stop sharing, please? Uh, so. Sorry, I have... uh, ah, stop sharing. Okay. Yeah, Sorry. please. Thank you. Okay. Good. I I don't know if they have listened to you because the microphone. Okay. Uh, Yasmin, uh, did you hear that we now make a break until five o'clock? Yes. So we have twenty okay. minutes, and I will. I mean, is it still gonna record? So just gonna okay. leave it like that, and we meet in now 19 minutes okay thank you thank you thank you
Hola. Hello. Can you, can you hear me? Yes. Yes? Yes. Okay. Okay, good. So in one minute, we should be starting. Yes. Claudia already shared her screen. Mm -hmm. Yes, but we cannot hear her yet. Hello? Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, now we can. Okay. That's microphone, isn't it? Are you using your microphone? Oh, there's one. Oh, there's one. Okay, perfect. And I would say. Hello, everybody. I hope everybody is back and maybe some new listeners, attendees. We are now coming to more electronic uh, topics. And um, Claudia from IREC will start with her talk on poor tolerant power converters. Please, Claudia. Uh, well, I am Claudia Cabrera-Piqueras from IREC. And I will be presenting IREC's approach on the optimization of power PV plants uh, in the sense of decreasing the failure impact on them. Uh, in that sense, our research is focused on a full tolerant power converter for solar PV applications. So to give a quick overview of the contents of this presentation, first of all, I will be um, exposing the aim and the approach of these projects. So. Uh, which are the common failures in solar PV systems, how can we overcome them, and which is the PV converter that we will be applying this know-how to. Then I will be carrying on to the development of the project. So I will be exposing IREC's proposal, um, having known the case study converter, and also which are the common faults and how we, can we overcome them. So how have we applied this know-how for, well, for IREC's proposal? Then I will move on on the, the results when I will show you some, some lab results and also a comprehensive analysis of the proposal in terms of efficiency, lifetime and cost. And finally, I will wrap up the presentation with some conclusions. So to start, um, well, uh, according to literature, uh, over 50% of the failure in PV systems are because of the power converter. And inside this 50% of failures due to power converter, there are three main uh, issues that are more important, which are capacitor failures, PCB failures, and semiconductor failures. So it's, it's um, of a special interest focusing on these three topics. And in this case, IREC proposal uh, revolves around um, semiconductor failures. So, can we decrease the failure impact in power PV converters? Well, first of all, there are two approaches to decreasing it. The first one is increasing the reliability of the power converter elements. So building converters whose components will last longer and thus the power converter will last longer. In this sense, we can employ components that have better reliability so that are better dimension and can last longer. Also, we can put lower stress on the components. For example, we can use reliability-oriented control. For instance, if we had a system that had several switches and one, one of the switches was heating, we could use a, a control scheme that would uh, make the power flow through another switch so that one that was heating cooled a little bit down and we could increase its lifetime. Also, we could employ fewer weak elements. The other approach to decrease failure impact in power PV converters is implementing fault tolerance. In this sense, we build converters that are able to survive a, a fault. Uh, to do so, we need redundancy structures or switches and the associated control strategy to control them. We need also failure detection and we need a reconfiguration circuit to, to implement the fault tolerance. IREX proposal is based on full tolerance, so let's take a moment to analyze this solution better. 
Well, first of all, um, there are some noted and known downsides of implementing fault tolerance. The first one is that we might have degraded operation or efficiency during post fault operation, which means that we may not be able to retrieve as much power as before the fault of the converter. The second one is that we might have harmonic distortion during post fault operation. And this is not desired because we don't want to pour harmonic distortion into the grid. And also, it's a phenomenon that would destroy components of the, the converter, like magnetics, for example. The next one is that we can have expensive fault diagnosis, both in economic terms, because we might need more sensors to detect this fault, and also in, in a computational sense, uh, because um, we might need more computation time to pull the information from the sensors and also to, to run the algorithm. And this is not desired because we, we are we are incrementing the time step of the control of the converter, and that might lead to a worse control of it. And finally, the last downside is that um, finding a single solution that can work for all the conversion stages is not widely studied in, in literature. So how can we implement fault tolerance? Well, there are three main approaches to it. The first one is having device redundancy which relies on having devices, well, switches in, in parallel in the converter. For instance, if we look at the picture, if we wanted to transmit the energy from one point to the other, we can have the, the both of the switches closed, but in case uh, one of the switches fails, the current path is still available and we might still have, um, well, we would still have energy flowing through the circuit. The second approach is phase redundancy. Let us say that we have a three-phase system, like in the electric grid, and one of the phases fails. Uh, with phase redundancy, uh, we have repeated structures in the converter that allows us to substitute this, this faulty phase and allows us to reproduce the wave that that well that we cannot generate anymore because that that certain part of the circuit has, has failed. So we are able to substitute all that structure. And finally, a state redundancy. Uh, let's take a look to this a little bit more complicated uh, circuit, but it's very easy to understand. And let's say that we want to uh, have the point B voltage in the output of the system. Well, we could use this upper switch path to have the voltage in the output. Um, but what happens if one of these switches fails? Well, we can only we can always use the lower path for having this this voltage on the output also. So state redundancy relies on uh, providing several current paths for, for an output voltage. Um, so now to understand um, which is the system we are applying this, uh, we have to take a look in which is the case study uh, power converter topology. So which is the structure of the power converter in, in PV systems? Uh, well, first of all, of course, we have a solar PV array that we have to connect to the electric. What is the problem? That the energy provided by the solar PV array is in the form of a direct current, so it's a constant. And the energy we have in the electric grid is a three-phase alternative currency. Um, that manifests the need of an intermediate equipment, which is the power converter, which is the element in charge of transforming from one type of energy to the other type of energy. The power converter, um, conventionally, um, consists in, in two stages. The first one is the DC-DC bus converter that is in charge of elevating the voltage that, that is provided by the solar PV array. This step allows us to have a voltage level that later on we will be able to transform in a, in a three-phase level at, at the voltage level of the grid. And the second stage is the DC-AC three-phase inverter which will take, as I said, this, this elevated voltage and transform it into a, an alternating uh, three-phase system. So to visualize this, this system in a circuit, let me show you the, well, the circuit structure for this topology. Let's first identify the elements. Here on the left would be the solar TV arise, and on the right it would be the electric grid. And the first switches that we find in the in the circuit, starting from the left, are the DC DC bus converter, and then the the six switches on the right are the DC AC three phase inverter. Well, um, 
Now we know which is the converter circuit. So the topology of the converter, we have to apply the fault tolerance to. And we also know which are the, the several approaches we can take to do so. Um, so let's move on, on to the proposed converter topology presented by IREC. Well, of course, we have the electric grid. So we will need a DCAC three-phase inverter. But in IREC's proposal, we are not only considering one solar PV array, but a modular approach in which we have several solar PV arrays uh, where each of these PV arrays has a DC-DC uh, boost converter that is connected to the, the same voltage level that later on the DCAC three-phase inverter will convert into a three-phase system to pour the energy into the electric grid. Moreover, um, this proposed converter implements fault tolerance by means of of a redundant extractor, so by means of phase redundancy, that is able to, to handle a fault in um, any stage of the converter. So, for instance, if a fault occurs on the DC DC bus converter number one, this redundant structure will be able to substitute the DC DC bus converter and, and, and the system would carry on working. Um, if, on the contrary, the, the Part of the system that fails is the DC, one of the phases of the DCAC uh, three-phase inverter. This uh, fault tolerant structure will be also able to substitute a fault in that stage. Uh, just to note, um, this fault tolerant structure is only able to survive a first fault. So now let's take a look to the circuit of this proposal. Don't get too afraid. It's just to understand how can we substitute a, a faulty switch. Um, as we did before, let's identify the, the elements of the circuit first. On the left, we can see the solar PV arrays, and on the right, we can see the electric grid. Um, the converters that are going to be highlighted right now are the DC-DC boost converters, and the converter that is being highlighted right now is the three-phase DC-AC uh, inverter. Um, and the structure highlighted in blue is the redundant leg and the reconfiguration switches of the of this redundant structure. The redundant leg is the structure that you see now highlighted in orange. And as you may have noticed, is a structure that repeats over all the converter in both DCAC stage and DC DC modules. Um, as this structure is repeated in all the converter, um, we are able to substitute the, the faulty leg or the, the faulty structure whenever the fault occurs. And how do we do that? Well, we use uh, reconfiguration switches that are able to connect the redundant leg to the middle point of where the faulty leg was. But, um, just to, to point out, um, this, this circuit, this technology is now being patented, so we could say that it's quite innovative, at least, <laughs> for it being of interest of, of being patented. Um, but well, knowing the circuit, how do we, how can we detect the faults when happening, and how can we know where this fault has occurred? Well, let me bring some water. Well, um, to start, we need different algorithms to detect a fault in the DCDC stage and in the DCAC stage. For the DCDC stage, what we do is check the current flow in in the in every boost converter, and we know that in regular operation, this current is positive, meaning that the energy is being transmitted from the solar PV array to the common uh, voltage pass. Um, if the current that is flowing through a DC-DC converter is zero, zero for a certain number of samples, we know that there has been a fault. For instance, if we had the case that we're seeing in the picture, we would see that, that from a constant current, there would be a sudden drop and the current would be zero uh, from that moment on. So we would know that there had been a fault in that, that certain converter. Um, for the DCAC stage, the algorithm may be a little bit more complex. Uh, what we do is check the inverter phase uh, current polarity, and we know that in regular operation, the average pola polarity in a grid period is zero. Because, uh, can you see my arrow? Well, no, it doesn't work really fine, so I will send you. <laughs> By, by words. Well, in sorry, in regular, yes, we can see your arrow when you move it. Okay, okay. Yeah, I, I thought it was too slow, but okay. No, it's okay. <laughs> okay. 
uh, in regular operation um, in a grid period, which would be, uh, uh, well, the, the period of a sine wave, we have the same amount of positive current than we do of negative current. So the polarity, as it's a symmetrical wave, would be zero because uh, there will be the equal part of positive current and negative current. With the topology of converter we're working with, uh, the faults will be will present only positive currents or negative currents. So when we have a fault, we'll only have positive current or negative current. This would mean that the polarity would, would stop being zero because we would no longer have a symmetrical wave. In that way, uh, when polarity is different than zero, we can detect there has been a fault and monitoring all the, the grid currents, we can know in which phase has the fault appeared. Well, um, these algorithms are positive because they require no additional sensors, so no additional cost in this sense for detection, and also they are um, magnitudes that are already used for the control. So the computational time would be um, no long, no, not much extended from a from, well, from a, a regular control. So knowing the proposed circuit and how we detect the the faults, uh, let's move on to the the results with this proposed technology. Uh, first of all, I uh, will show you some the results of some prototype testing. And we do this prototype testing because we want to validate the full detection and location algorithm. So we want to know if with these algorithms we can really know where this fault has occurred. We also want to validate the reconfiguration factor, and meaning that we want to see that we have proposed it's, it's valid for this certain application. And we also want to compare simulated and experimental data. To do so, uh, we have built a five kilowatt lab scale prototype that we control using the CPU of, of OP4510, which is a fast prototyping platform by Opal RT, that we have coded with MATLAB Simulink um, to, be, to perform as a control and, and, as, an, uh, and as a data logger. And taking into account that even though we take a modular approach, we only have emulator emulated two solar PV arrays for size limitations in the in the laboratory. Let me show you some pictures of this of this prototype testing. In the upper left side, we can see the, the switches for the, the DC AC inverter and the DC DC bus converters and redundant leg. In the upper left pictures, we can see the, the sensing structure and also the magnetics for the circuit. And in the right side, we can see the, the test bench for it. Um, this is the, the control platform system. And in the screen, we can see the, the monitor that we use to control the, the system. And with this monitor, um, we could tell the system where to emulate the falls, uh, when to do so, um, which were the well, the safety parameters of the system and so on. So let me show you now the results for testing, well, for emulating a fault on the DC, DC stage. Um, just to refresh a little bit, this is the stage that is uh, next to the solar PV arrays. And we will be testing, well, emulating a fault in the only switch of the boost converter. Uh, just to point it out, um, to emulate a fault on the on this switch, what we did is stop sending uh, the switch operating signals. So we left the switch open to say it's simple. In that way, we emulate that this, this switch has failed. Uh, here you can see the simulation results. In the first scope, uh, there's the, the DC voltage, common DC voltage for all the, the PV, the, the DC DC converters. In the second scope, you can see the grid currents. In the third scope, you can see the current of the converter. And on the third and fourth scope, you can see the, the monitor of the of how many um, sample times has been the, the current of the system been zero. Next to it, we can see the experimental results. The order of the, well, even though it has two scopes, the order of the magnitudes is the same. The common DC voltage, the grid um, currents, the, the converter current, and lastly, the the indicator of the fault detection. And well, uh, first of all, we can see that the fault has been detected uh, only 10.6 milliseconds after a fault event um, for experimental tests. 
as we saw when when I introduced the detection algorithms, we can see that when a fault occurs, so when it's indicated in here, the current of the converter drops to zero, uh, so we can detect the fault that way. And the fault is reconfigurated very quick after the fault detection, only one, 0 0.1 milliseconds after it. That makes a total lapse time of 10.7 milliseconds, and that means that when a fault occurs on the DCDC stage, the, this proposed technology is able to, to reconfigure the system in less than a quick period, which is quite quick. Now let's move on to simulating the, well, emulating the failures in the DCAC stage. Uh, to refresh a little bit, this is the, the grid side. And as we have two switches in for each phase in this stage, we will be able, well, we will emulate fail failures in the top switch and in the bottom switch. First of all, let's start with the top switch. Here we can see the simulation results. Again, uh, the first scope is the, the common voltage for the DCDC DC and DCAC converters. The second scope is the grid currents, and the third scope is the polarity detector, let's say. And here are the experimental results with the same magnitudes. Uh, in this case, as we have emulated the fault on the top switch, we're not able to have a positive current, as we can see in, in this scoping here. Um, so, well, not having this, this positive current, we are able to detect the fault uh, 7.8 milliseconds after the fault event has occurred. Again, the system reconfiguration is quite quick. It's, it's only 0 0.1 milliseconds after the fault detection. So that means that the total lapse time uh, between a fault appearing and the system working uh, fine again, let's say, is less than, than a grid period again. Finally, to, to finish with the prototype testing section, uh, let me show you the results for emulating a fault in the bottom switch of the DCAC stage. Um, the magnitudes are the same that the ones uh, shown for the top switch, which are the, the common voltage for the, all the converters, the grid currents, and uh, the full location variable, let's say. Um, well, in this case, we can see that as we have emulated the fault in the bottom switch, where the, the current that we are not able to get is the negative current. So we can see here that the, the fault was emulated in, in between of the negative semi-period semi of the current. So once the fault is emulated, we no longer have um, negative currents, but we have zero. In that sense, we could say that this is somehow of a worse case than before scenario, because we have an in-between positive current that stops the, the fault detection signal from, from growing, so from, from being able to detect when a fault occurs. But anyway, uh, we're able to detect the fault uh, 18.5 milliseconds after a fault event in both simulation and experimental results. And again, the fault reconfiguration is quite quick. So the total lapse time, even though this is um, not an ideal scenario of, of having a fault in that specific uh, grid cycle moment, uh, well, we can get the system reconfigured in less than, than a grid period also. Um, so now let's move on into some analysis regarding efficiency, lifetime, and also cost. Uh, well, first of all, uh, regarding the efficiency analysis, uh, what we want to know is how much do the total losses vary with this, this presenting the technology. In pre-fault operation, we take into account that the, the 80 percent of the converter losses are due to the semiconductors, so the switches, that are working, and that the power converter efficiency is of 95 percent or less. In post-fault operations, not only we do have the working semiconductor losses, but also the, the losses that happen on the well that occur on the reconfiguration switch, so the, on the switch that is connected, connecting the, the redundant leg to the faulty leg. So how much do total losses vary? Well, this depends on the number of modules that we take into account, but they are very little. For example, uh, for one module only, the loss increase for this reconfiguration switch is a 1% compared to the to per fault operation. Uh, when considering two modules, the loss increase is only of a 0.5%, and when considering three modules, the loss increase even decreases more and is of 0.3%. This makes sense because um, the variation 
a loss variation will have more impact if we have less converters. So it makes sense that for more converters we have for for less converters we have more variation. Sorry. Uh, all in all, we can see that there with this proposal, well, with, the, with this um, proposed topology and, and algorithm, we have a really small impact on on losses and efficiency of the system. Um, now moving on to the lifetime analysis, the question that we want to answer is how much longer will the PV power converter work with the presented topology? But um, first of all, uh, we will express this in terms of the mean time to failure that is expressed in working years uh, until failure, accounting for the equipment working seven days a week uh, during 24 hours. So for a conventional converter, it also varies with the number of modules because uh, the more modules we have, the more probability for one to fail we have. So, but taking as a reference, for example, the case of one module, the mean time to failure of a, a conventional converter, so a non fault tolerant converter, will be four and a half years, more or less. With the presented fault tolerant converter, we're able to increase uh, this mean time to failure uh, to 60% in the case of one module and, and a little bit less as. as as much as we add modules, but anyway, we're able to increase more than a 50 percent the, the lifetime of the converter, which is a, a, a significant increment. And finally, uh, moving on to the cost analysis, um, it's interesting to study which is the additional cost for this technology. So we start this analysis, analysis knowing that the semiconductors and ancillary circuits of of a converter account for 12% uh, of the total power converter cost. And then a uh, redundant leg would cause an increase of the total cost of more or less uh, 6%. So this is a very little increase on the convention on the converter cost. But the real question is what is the revenue of this additional cost? Well, first of all, we have estimate, estimated that operation and maintenance costs would be reduced by an 11% both preventive and correct operation and maintenance costs, and that the system downtime will be reduced by a 36% because we wouldn't have this unscheduled system stops that we earlier have had before implementing the fault tolerance system. Um, so now let's move on to some conclusions. Uh, well, from IREC in, the, in Super PV, we have presented a cost effective fault tolerant power converter for solar PV applications. Uh, we also have presented lab tests uh, that of this concept design and, and our prototype development. We have been able to increase the, the reliability of the converter in, in solar PV applications system with uh, minor economic impact. impact. And from IREC, we think that this solution is especially interesting for those systems that are harder to reach and show higher operating and maintenance costs, like floating PV systems and PV plants located in remote areas. Okay. I missed one. <laughs> well, I missed the, the, the last slide. I don't know where it is, but <laughs> well, it was thank you for your attention, but, but I can tell you this by <laughs> my voice. Uh, well, uh, that would be all by my side. I hope that I have been able to be clear with this presentation and that I have you brought a little bit closer to understanding the, um, the optimization from a power electronics point of view. Uh, well, thank you for your attention and, and feel free to, to contact me if you're interested in this line of research or, or technology. So that would be all. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Claudia. Excellent. So. A complicated topic, uh, very clearly described. Thank you very much. Um, other questions? Oh, there is a clapping hands coming up. That's good. <laughs> OK, so other questions from the audience? Here or there, let's say. I have a question. <laughs> uh, Factory, your, your, uh, your system is based on software instead of redundant. Hardware. You say that uh, there are different methods. One the method is a redundant mm -hmm. hardware, and this is a software uh, detection. Uh, well, um, we have a, a hardware structure that yes. is that is held by this software that is able to detect where the fault has occurred and yeah. knows 
where to connect this this hardware. Yeah. So we have both hardware and software. Um, okay. Yeah. Are there questions from outside this room? Yasmin, do you hear us? Yes, I do, but I okay. don't have any question. Just um, as maybe when we post it, it will be more uh, questions online from the people who are going to watch it. So uh, yeah, maybe you will receive some emails with questions. I hope this is OK for you, Claudia. Yeah, and thank you very much for your presentation.